so I watched the Backrooms TV show, and it was all right. If you've been a fan of my channel for a long time, you might remember a video that I uploaded about a year ago? About a year. The video was called, So the Backrooms is Getting a TV Show, or something like that. I, th I think it was called that. But essentially, that video was me just yapping for about eight minutes over this article that American Horror Story, the TV show, released, saying they were going to have a Backrooms episode come out in their next season. And that is exactly what this video is about. The episode came out and I watched it. It came out a couple weeks ago. I just got around to watching it in my extremely busy schedule. So in this video today, I'm going to be explaining the episode, breaking it down, ripping up all the Easter eggs and showing them all to you, talking about the hidden secrets, the parallels, the inspiration that the show took from real Backrooms lore and pretty much everything like that. So if that sounds even the slightest bit entertaining, please leave a like, please. I would really, really appreciate it. And without further ado, let's get into the breakdown of this American Horror Story Backrooms episode, shall we? Also, check out my hat, guys. Check this out. Skibbity. You like that? When I went into watching this episode, I didn't really know what to expect. I had no idea what was going to come up. Nothing like this has been done before. The Backrooms as a concept hasn't been put to the big screen quote unquote, and yes, this is a TV show, but it hasn't been realized in a sort of realistic way. All we've seen is found footages from YouTube, which those are cool and stuff, but that's not the same as like a TV production, which is what this is. But what I found in this American Horror Story Backrooms episode is that the set design was fantastic. The aesthetics were amazing. The camera angles were really good and they shot it perfectly for a Backrooms themed episode, I think. The storyline was good. It was not great. It was some weak points that I'll mention later. I'm not here to judge it. I'm not a TV critic or anything, but this is the Backrooms episode, so I'm going to yap about it. But the most surprising inclusion for me was the meta and realistic inclusion of actual Backrooms lore from the Wikidot, from the fandom, from Kane Pixels, and literally all three of them, and other found footage people on YouTube as well. Like There was actual inspiration that the writers and the animators drew from online, which is super cool. Really glad they did that. Makes it more realistic, makes fans enjoy it more, like myself. So if you have not seen the actual episode yet, I recommend go check it out right now on Hulu. You can watch it, it's just titled Backrooms. Go watch it before this breakdown. But if you're lazy and you don't wanna watch it, you can just watch this video, cause I'm gonna summarize it right here and go over all the Easter eggs and such. But with all that said, let's turn on the inner mat, Pat and let's break down what we just saw, or what I just saw. You didn't watch it with me, I watched it by my, you, you get it. So the main leading character in this episode is this guy right here. His name is Daniel Hausman Berger. And in the storyline in this episode, his son named Roman has gone missing without a trace. Just vanished into thin air and there's no evidence supposedly this daniel character is a hollywood screenwriter type guy he's very rich he's pretty famous and ever since roman his kid has gone missing he's kind of sequestered himself into his own house kind of cut himself off in the world definitely depressed as he would be if your kid vanished without a trace Apparently, Daniel's been self-isolating for a long time, and it got people so worried that his agent, named Aaron, came to his house to check on him. That was a voice crack, I apologize for it. But Aaron is Daniel's agent, he gets him gigs for Hollywood, and like I said, he's been so worried about him that he hasn't been answering his calls, hasn't been answering the phone or anything, that he came all the way out to his house to check up on him. Daniel gets mad at Aaron for trying to help him, and it gets defensive and is like, what do you know, your kid didn't go missing you can see where it's going from here. Eventually, Daniel storms off in a fit of rage and yells at Aaron, tells him to leave and get out of the house and to not come back. And during this fit of rage, Daniel opens a door to what I think was his office and he walks in. Except behind the door is not his office, it's this infinite looking grocery store. This backroomsy grocery store. Now, if you have a keen eye, this grocery store might look pretty familiar to you if you've seen the YouTuber named Ruster's very famous backrooms infinite grocery store found footage. I'll leave a link to that below. I've seen it many times. It was one of the most famous videos. It's got like 3 million views. It's a great video. But this is just one of many inspirations the writers and, and animators and set designers took from the actual backrooms fandom. I'll mention all of them when we get to them. But Daniel's here in this infinite store. He's obviously very very freaked out like he just walked into this store that nobody's in there's something in my eye out he's obviously very freaked out that he just walked into a store and there's nobody in there the lights are very odd there's infinite products 
it, it's very interesting. He's definitely weirded out. Now, I do love the set design for this grocery store. I think it definitely encapsulates liminal spaces, in between areas, the back rooms, whatever you want to call them, it definitely fits the vibe. The perfectly aligned shelves, the perfectly aligned full stocked items, the retro looking floor, the design of the actual store itself with the buzzing lights and stuff, it's perfect, okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Brutally approved. Daniel keeps walking around this store and he eventually starts hearing voices over the PA system. This causes him to grab a shovel to defend himself. Which again, this is a direct reference to Ruster's found footage because the protagonist in that footage grabs a shovel to defend themselves and he tries to break out of the exit door, which Daniel also does. He finds a door, tries to break it down with the shovel, and he can't. At this point, blood begins to seep out from under the exit door between Daniel's feet and of course this kind of sends him into a spiral. The same thing happens in the Ruster found footage, there is blood seeping from the door. Anyways, Daniel falls over and he looks up to see what he believes is his son, Roman, in a mask, standing next to a figure who is also in a mask and a cool looking robe. The lights start to glitch and the figures both walk away. Daniel glitches back to reality, definitely freaked out from what he just saw, and it freaks him out so much, he actually calls up his agent Aaron to try to apologize for storming off early, for sending him away, and he kind of realizes that he's kind of messed up in the head. But on this phone call, Daniel realizes that when he stormed off, when he went into his office and he was inside the store, he was actually gone from real life for three entire weeks. What seemed to be 15, 20 minutes for him in the store was three weeks of real life. Which again, this strange time warping stuff that's common in the backroom's lore, I'm kind of glad they included that in this episode. He asks Aaron to meet up with him at a restaurant so they can talk about all the stuff that Daniel just experienced, but when Daniel does walk into the restaurant, he not only sees Aaron, but he also sees his own ex-wife. I talked about the ex-wife earlier, but we don't really know much about her at this point. They sit down, Daniel starts talking very strangely about how hell is real and we live alongside it. He's obviously referring to the back rooms, but during all that weird monologuing, his ex-wife blurts out that Roman is dead and they found his body buried inside of a park. This sort of snaps Daniel out of his trance and he asks if they found any evidence, which is Kind of interesting and totally not foreshadowing at all for what's to come. Anyways, he starts to argue with his ex-wife and then he storms away yet again. And this time he's going to the bathroom inside of this restaurant. But when he goes to the bathroom, he opens the door and he enters backrooms level zero. The famous wallpaper buzzing lights yellow place. He turns around and the door is gone and he is just stuck in the labyrinth. At this point, Daniel begins to walk around the halls of level zero, and he's battling with all these weird shapes and shadows he sees, and this loneliness and this buzzing feeling. He gets lost, and he ends up finding a ladder that leads to a tunnel. At first, he says no, which is pretty funny. Like, he literally looks at the ladder, and he says nope, but then he gets lost, and he comes back to the ladder, and he decides that his only way out is to climb it. Anyways, Daniel decides to climb up the ladder and to enter the crevice of no return. At the end of the tunnel, he just finds more backrooms level zero area and he starts walking around until he locates this door he opens up the door he walks in he sees this old tv playing a show and he goes over and he kind of turns the knob to change the channel while he does this the area behind him transforms into this dinner setting with a giant roasted pig in the middle of the table he walks over to this roasted pig rips open the pig and he sees a oscar that has his name on it one of the ones that was shown earlier in the episode inside the pig that's Cool. Okay. Anyways, he picks up this Oscar, and out of nowhere, these masked figures with the robes begin to clap like an audience would for the Oscar winner. And of course, this freaks Daniel out, so he just runs through them and gets out to the level zero area, where he again sees his son, Roman. Except this time, he doesn't really have a mask on, he just has two missing eyes where the mask should be. They're just gone. Daniel tries to run, but those robed dudes kind of just grab him and throw him against the wall, and that tosses him back to reality, and he's just screaming bloody murder inside of that bathroom that he walked into. At this point, Daniel is thoroughly freaked out. He's experienced this back room's middle area twice, and he doesn't know what's causing it. So he goes to a really fake looking Google, and he searches up what he's experiencing. He finds a link to liminal spaces in the back rooms, and he begins to watch a Brugley video on how to escape it. Just kidding, they didn't cast me, I'm going to cry myself to sleep. But anyways, he does find a YouTuber named Eli the Navigator, who allegedly has uploaded this found footage of the back rooms, the same place that Daniel went, and he gets interested, kinda has like a little panicky moment, cause 
he thought that he was the only person experiencing it, so he slams the laptop shut. You know how it works. In the video, Eli says that his iPhone camera would not record the back rooms and it wouldn't record the audio. And the only time he could record was with like an eight millimeter film camera. So that's what this is showing. At the end of the video, Eli says that if you've experienced this or if you have questions or whatever, try to find him and he'll tell you about it. So Daniel tracks him down and Eli is in jail. Yay! But while meeting with Eli in jail, Daniel, along with us, the audience, kind of gets some exposition and some explanation on how American Horror Story thinks the backrooms works. And this is where a lot of the people start to hate the episode, which, you know, whatever, you can do that. But I, I think it was okay. I think it was kind of a decent premise, maybe executed poorly, but this is what Eli had to say. Eli basically goes on to explain that the backrooms is a purgatory, a place that you will continue to experience if you've committed some sort of wrongdoing, if you've been like a terrible person, if you've done an act of aggression, you killed somebody, you maimed somebody, and you haven't turned yourself in, you haven't faced the reality of the situation. Any person that's done that has the opportunity to enter this backrooms hell, this purgatory. Eli then goes on to explain that the backrooms is kind of like a video game, where in a video game, all the textures, all the sounds you see are just an edifice. They're a facade for the actual mechanical underworkings, just the basic shapes and textures. And he says that that's exactly how reality is, that the world we see is just what we've been programmed to see. We've just been programmed to see the textures, the sounds, but if we can shift our programming, we can see this underworking, this backrooms, this middle area. This explanation is pretty decent. A lot of people don't like it. I've seen some YouTube videos where people are dogging on it. It's whatever. This is a TV show. You know, they're allowed to make their own adaptations. It's whatever. I don't really care that much. What I do enjoy is how it's kind of tied to human emotion and how it's kind of like it presented as a hell. It's pretty interesting. Eli then goes on to say that Daniel will continue to experience the back rooms until he fesses up and owns up to his bad deed or whatever, which kind of makes Daniel mad because he didn't tell Eli that he did something bad. He kind of gets standoffish and defensive, and Eli just assumes that he's done some awful thing. Foreshadowing. Now, the reason Eli was in the back rooms, the reason why he got to experience it, is because he ran over a really famous athlete while she was jogging, and then he lied to the police that he was not distracted on his phone, even though he was, and the back room stuff didn't stop until he turned himself in, and that's why he's in jail. Like I said, kind of a loose, meh story, but it's, it's alright, I guess. Anyways, Daniel leaves, gets up, and he goes back home with all that information that he just got told and he, he's gonna just fess up to it. So police cars show up outside of his house and he calls Aaron again and he proceeds not to fess up to whatever he's done. In fact, Aaron yells on the phone, how could you do it? Why could you do it? How could you kill your own son and stuff like that? And it's then shown that Daniel killed his own kid. There was totally no foreshadowing for this at all. But in the show, they DNA tested the blanket that his son Roman was buried in and they found prints from Daniel is dad, and now they're swatting his house to arrest him. The cops are breaking in, Daniel runs to his office, he grabs his own gun to try to fight back, he fires off some awful aim, that is, literally he didn't even try to aim, he's just shooting randomly. But while he's getting shot and falling to the ground, we get a little bit more exposition as to him and his ex-wife's relationship falling apart, and how he, he strangled his son in the park in broad daylight. When his body hits the ground, he enters the back rooms for a third time, and in this time he's in sort of some red rooms area with a weird looking witch woman who's holding his son, but also talking with the son's voice. This is where it kind of loses me a little bit, but I can give it a pass, I don't really care. It's a show, you know, it's fake. This red woman like tells Daniel to admit to what he's done and he'll be able to escape this liminal hell and be able to get out of the back rooms. And he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll admit it, I'll do whatever, I, I, I need to get out of here. So the red woman directs him to this waiting room, which is outside of the red rooms. Daniel walks into the waiting room and he, he punches his ticket to get in line to admit to what he's done. And his ticket number is 0922-337-3032-8547758807. And there's a board that's right above him that says the back rooms or whatever is now serving guest one, which insinuates that Daniel will be in this waiting room pretty much forever, because that that's like an infinite number almost. So if you couldn't get it, Daniel's pretty much in hell now for strangling his kid. That's that's how they played the end of the episode off. But now I want to direct your attention at some small little Easter eggs that I didn't outright mention in the second half of the episode. The most recent one is that really long number that was on Daniel's ticket is probably a reference to the 64-bit integer backrooms level that's very, very famous. I have a video about it, it was like 5 million views and it's very popular. It used to be the end level and maybe they took inspiration from it. The only difference is they're like three numbers off. There's three numbers that are different. I'm not sure why they did that, but I, I think it's close enough to where they have to have been referencing that 
or it's some kind of freak coincidence. I don't know, but they're probably referencing that. The Red Rooms and the Red Woman might be referencing level run or the Red Rooms level from the back rooms. It could be a reference to that. And at the end there, when he punches his ticket to get waited on for how he died, that's pretty much exactly copying the Beetlejuice ending. You know, Beetlejuice and people in the movie die and they have to go get their ticket number and yada, yada, yada. That's exactly what happens in this. They definitely reference that for sure. But those are just some little references and nods to the Backrooms community and other pop culture stuff as well that you might have missed. I personally will give this episode a 6 out of 10. It wasn't horrible. People are literally dogging on it for no reason, I think. I don't really like the part of the Backrooms fan base that is so nitpicky. I think people should be allowed to make their own adaptations as they see fit. And I think they adapted it to the show, to a show format, as best they could. They did fine. It was better than I could do. And it was interesting enough to watch. You know, I sat down and I watched the whole thing. I didn't turn it off angrily or whatever. And I, I do enjoy the nods to Kane Pixels, to the, the found footages from, from Ruster and stuff like that, the effects and stuff, the glitching, the Beetlejuice nod, that was pretty cool. Maybe the 64-bit integer number nod, the Red Rooms. I think, I think they did enough to where you can kind of see the fan service if that's what they were going for. But it kind of comes off as somebody who just looked up backrooms popular videos and they went through the most popular footages and took one bit from each thing like Kane's video is most popular and then like there's my video with 5 million views about the 64 bit integer number and there's Ruster's found footage with 3 million views you know it kind of just seems like that but they could have just done actual research I don't know I'm not here to place blame I liked it 6 out of 10 60 percent that's a that's a low D grade I guess storyline kind of weak visuals were pretty good I like the liminal horror aspect the uh, mask dudes with no backstory were kind of interesting. I'm not really sure what they were going for there, but it was creepy enough. It was still really cool to see the creepypasta realized on the big screen. And I think that's what people need to acknowledge more. It's not really about how perfect or whatever they can make the, the design or the story. It's that we finally got the back rooms on a screen. And I think it's just a pretty neat, nifty thing. I don't know. I don't know why y'all are complaining so much. I guess I don't love it. It's a 6 out of 10, but it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. It, it still is an interesting unique watch and even if they made the episode like some people were saying just to get the backrooms name in it just to like get views from that so it, it still looks cool they did it good enough it's not like it was completely fake looking you know it, it was okay i'm not gonna sit here and complain about it but i'm gonna go ahead and end off the description there if you enjoyed this breakdown if you want more breakdowns of footages and future tv shows the the Kane pixels movies coming out um leave a like i always love breaking down stuff analyzing it doing all that stuff i love yapping pretty much and that's what i get to do in these videos but while you're down there dropping a like Check out the description for my Instagram, my Twitter, my other channel, Spoogly, where I do like documentaries and stuff. And if you want more of me, just click those links, check it out. With all that said, make sure to tell somebody you love them. Life's too short not to. And I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.